Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and I are located on the territories of the Lekwungen, known today as the Song Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations in Victoria, British Columbia. I extend my appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory. And I encourage all of you watching to consider the traditional territory on whose land you are on today. And feel free to add your own land acknowledgement into the chat. Well, our program, RBCM at Home, began last year, quite a while ago. And this is the first time I've had a guest from the Exhibit Art Studio. Today, we're going to be talking about a recent exhibit of mushrooms made by the Exhibit Arts Technicians here at the Royal BC Museum. My guest is Colin Longprey, an exhibit arts fabricator of many skills. And Colin has been at the Royal BC Museum since when, Colin? 2003. 2003, wow. And you can see his work in our feature exhibitions, notably those thematic entrances that have been created. Uh, if you remember behind the scenes, there was a big um, magnifying glass that you walk through or from Maya walking through the arches of an ancient Maya temple. And most recently that beautiful tale in our orcas exhibit. You can also see his work in our core galleries and special events. Colin, before we talk about the mushroom exhibit, can you tell us about a typical day for an exhibit facilitate, an exhibit technician at the museum? Well, a typical day would probably be arriving between 7, 38 in the morning. And that gives us a few hours before opening to actually do our gallery rounds. So each of us is responsible for a different gallery. And it's our job to do a walkthrough, make sure all the lights are on, make sure the computers are working, make sure the galleries are clean. And um, so we'll usually spend a few hours doing that. We also feed the fish, maybe top up the water wheel. Uh, so there's water in there, that kind of thing. After that, during the day, we'll have a, very, a variety of projects, some small, some big. We might have um, a small project that's sort of, uh, you know, might take us a few hours that day, but we're often, uh, especially when we're busy doing the, like building something like orcas, uh, then we'll have major projects. So we might be responsible for building a section of the, a, or a section or a component of that exhibit, which could take us weeks or months to build. And uh, we're also responsible for partially designing how it's fabricated as well. We might get an image of what the designer wants, but it's up to us to figure out how to build it. That's really neat. I, and the work is so creative. Mm -hmm. But I don't think a lot of people with carpentry or um, uh, making skills think of museums as a place where they can work. How did you get started working in a museum? Um, completely by accident, actually, probably, mm -hmm. um, which is probably what happens to most people in this trade, because most people, as you just said, don't know that there's actually a job doing this. Um, I was probably 11 or 12 when I actually built my own museum at our cottage, and I used to collect things and put them on display. I never thought that there was an actual job in a museum. After high school, I decided I thought I'd be a carpenter for, for my career. And when I finished that, I, well, a neighbor worked at the museum in Regina, Saskatchewan. And so they were about to undertake a, a multi-year renovation. So I got on there very early in, in Regina um, and um, learned on the job. I basically just had a motto, I can do anything I can try. And so whatever they asked me to do, I would do it and I would learn how to do it. And then those skills allowed me to um, move to BC here in Victoria, where I applied for the job at the Royal BC Museum. And I continue my work here, pretty much doing the same thing I did then, so. And something recently you were asked to do was make mushrooms. What was the impetus for this exhibition? Um, it follows the publication of um, a recent book that the museum published on mushrooms. And they wanted to have a, a small traveler that could go around to you know, sort of um, highlight this book. And so each of the exhibit texts were assigned a few uh, mushroom models to make from scratch uh, to go with this uh, exhibit. Wow. 
So what happened, we, uh, I was downstairs uh, and I'm walking by the exhibits and I could see everybody working on these really cool looking mushrooms and they were all in different states and we thought this would be really neat to share with everyone. So Jenny, who hosts our behind the scenes of these sessions, she went down and she made a recording and we're gonna see a short video that features four, uh, four of the exhibit architects, including Colin. We'll see Devin, Joel, and Cindy, and then Colin. And they each did something a little bit different to create one of these beautiful models that we're going to see. So Colin and I will go on mute, and I'm going to share the video. And during the video, if you have questions, please use the chat. Uh, and then at the end, we'll, we'll answer your questions. All right. So we're making some replica mushrooms um, of BC's edible mushrooms and my two mushrooms that I'm working on are the pine mushrooms and the bluet. Can we try starting it again? Oh, you're muted, Kim. We can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. I lost it all. Were you able to see it and hear it before? We were able to see it, but it was very choppy. So we can yeah, see it. it's interesting. Okay, I'm going to try again. I had uh, in the earlier test, it was working all right. So we'll try one more time. Maybe make sure it says it's um, sharing screen with the video. Um, yes, enhancement. Yeah, that is there. And now the video is gone. All right, I think I have the video back. No, I don't. Jenny, are you able to give it a try on your end? And while yes. Jenny has One a look for that video, uh, Colin, I'll ask you a little bit more about the exhibit. How many um, mushrooms were you, did you make in total? Um, I had three mushrooms. Um, some of the others had two. One of the exhibit techs had one. Um, so I, we, um, sometimes we made one or two of each mushroom. It depended on how much room was available in the exhibit. Um, each mushroom is displayed on a small plinth, um, roughly five to six inches wide. So there's not a lot of lands. A lot, a lot of room to put these on. Mm -hmm. Luckily, yeah, they're, and they're not that super large either. No. <laughs> so during the process, you had um, experts come. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, how you got guidance? Yes, we, um, the authors of the book um, came by twice to inspect our work. So it kind of felt like, you know, we were art students having our, our, our work critiqued by the, by the instructor. Uh, but it was obviously very helpful because um, one of the things that we, some of us didn't have were actual mushrooms to work with. We only had images off the internet. And so um, not having the mushroom was a bit of a detriment, but um, having the experts there tell us what we did right and what we did wrong was very helpful. So. Great. And when we see the video, there'll be a short little, very short little clip at the beginning. And that is, uh, the, the, those are the authors coming in to yeah. give advice. Uh, Trish is asking about the exhibit. Where is it now? It's at Swan Lake right now in Victoria. Great. Swan Lake Nature House has the exhibit there. So if people are able, they can check it out. All right. Jenny has it up and let's give it another try. Thanks, Jenny. Nice so we're making some replica mushrooms um, of BC's edible mushrooms and my two mushrooms that I'm working on are the pine mushrooms and the bluet. And so here's some examples of uh, pine mushrooms during two different stages of their life. Um, they sort of start out as a smaller little knob and then grow and expand into something more like this with 
gills and a huge cap and a ring coming off of the stem. And so for these ones, um, I've started with a styrofoam carved into its basic shape. For the stem, it's got a styrofoam core here and this cap will come off. And then been applying uh, rag paper with some matte medium to sort of get it wet and adhering to the form and getting some nice sort of peeling and things to mimic how this expands and grows out of the ground and sort of um, uh, breaks its outer layer of skin apart. Mm. And then sort of using a heat gun on the paper to get some of the burning and browning of the paper, which mimics kind of how it ends up getting quite dirty from earth and things like that. Um, and the cap itself, um, this was a definitely the most challenging. I did a number of different attempts, but ended up uh, 3D modeling the cap and 3D printing it on our resin printer to get the gills to be nice and fine and regular. Doing other things like carving um, away from foam and trying to use p uh, paper on edge was proving much too difficult. So. That ended up working quite well and providing accuracy I don't think I would have been able to achieve. Mm. Um, and then putting some foam on top to get more sculptural because the print itself was quite a clean glossy surface and didn't look like a natural object so mm. had to sort of um, combine a whole bunch of materials for that one. You can kind of see this is where the ring on the stem during its uh, maturity it breaks away from this cap margin so it sort of will come like this and you'll see the paper tear here and here where it starts to expand and then this curls under and forms all the gills it'll just be these two for this one you know we have a limited space constraint but it'll be something like this where then we um, fill in this base with a lot of earth and dirt mm. and needles to make it sort of look more like its little environment um, yeah, if we had more, I mean, you can see some of the photos where it will really show the process of that ring mm. separating from the cat, which is an interesting little mushroom. These ones are pretty popular for edible mushrooms. Mm. And some of the other attempts, which, you know, will just get discarded, but it is good to play with different uh, variety of methods and things. And this is the bluet, um, which is a fairly basic looking. Was, this was another mushroom with gills which were complicated to do and these ones I ended up carving out of the foam because they are a little bit bigger in size than the pine mushroom gills. And just trying to um, airbrush the paint to show sort of the complexity of the color being purple and blue going from brown with reds and some whiter grays. There's a lot of colors that go on in these caps that end up looking like quite a little um, greasy thing. It's hard to replicate. Mm -hmm. but this one I'm still working on because I had sort of started with this and um, I had made sort of an error in, in the order of operations and I needed to actually start with a painted piece of styrofoam before applying this paper. Mm -hmm. And I'll just show you how I do that. So I just have some matte medium and rag paper that I'm tearing into these strips and trying to get a variety of thickness of paper that once I actually apply this matte medium to it just sort of gets wet and malleable and I can work with it a lot more where um, yeah, I can start to tear it and, and get some nice natural tears that I think would be hard to try to sculpt or something like that mm. manually. And then just trying to, this one's been working from top down so as I layer it it sort of has that same effect like I was talking about of of growing out of that base and then I just sort of apply lots and lots of matte medium get it wet which allows me to then sort of really start to rough it up like I can sort of peel away bits mm -hmm. of the paper I can let it curl and when that's got to an okay point, I um, will hit it all with a heat gun to get oh. that, that burning and charring. Ah. So I can sort of show you how that happens. Too. So not only you get the, the shape that you want, but you can get the color you yeah, want from exactly. the same material. Exactly. So it was a nice efficient process to get something 
fairly natural looking that I think would have been hard to do otherwise. Oh, for sure. Yeah, you can kind of start to see how just applying lots of this and and tearing away at it gets it a nice sort of tears and rolling that mimics the um, actual skin of the mushroom. So mm -hmm. it's been fun to kind of work with this and kind of find these methods that, um, I don't know, I guess they're a little unusual, but it works pretty well. And the, this is nice trying to replicate these natural things because you can't really get too wrong with it. Mm. If you make it look really dirty and, and gross like that, that's what it's all about. Mm. These things emerge out of the dirt and so you can't, can't go too wrong. Yeah, so keep going here. Try not to burn the place. <laughs> see some browning happening oh, here. Yeah. And so I mean it's good to try to do a little subtle with it. I did a few attempts where I went too quickly and it got quite dark but you, know, you can see some of the browning happening. And as it goes down its base it gets darker and darker so I'll I'll sort of really apply a lot of heat down here at the bottom. So you can see some nice textures happening already. Oh, for sure. It really makes it even more 3D when you yeah. have, it's just like you're adding shading to it. Almost. Exactly. So let's see if I can get this little strand here to darken a bit. What I could do is even get out a flame and tar it like a marshmallow. <laughs> it kind of looks like a marshmallow. <laughs> like a marshmallow that's about to fall off the stick. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so that's been my sort of process with the pine mushroom. So cool. I am making one mushroom, and it's the hardest mushroom, and I'm doing a great job. <laughs> or so I'm told by the mushroom expert. Mm. This is a belly button hedgehog. And I'm working on that. I'm actually making two versions. They don't have any color on them right now. So I still have to paint them. But they're going to look kind of like this color here, more of a, a yellow, creamy color. And I'm just in the final process of gluing these last few little tiny teeth on the bottom and you can see how when you look at it from underneath it kind of almost looks hairy or furry so i tried a lot of different ways to do this but i i found that the best way is to roll little rolls of, of oven clay and bake them and then cut the tips off of them with an exacto knife to make these little points. And then I'm gluing each point onto the mushroom with a little bit of glue and then finding a spot that I can slide it in. And I gotta do this over a period of time because you can only do so many at once. So this has taken a couple of hours actually to go through and glue each individual one on and you can see they're longer closer to the stem and then they taper out and get shorter closer to the edge of the cap so it's a bit tricky and what type of the the top of it and the stem what are those made of uh it's all the same material um it's a kind of like an oven baked clay kind of like a fimo and uh, I can pull this one out and then um, we, we sculpt them uh, to kind of get them to look close and then when you put it in the, in the oven it bakes hard so that I made the stem in one piece and the cap as a separate piece and then I screwed them together and then I added all of the teeth 
so it's a little bit of a process but I still have to work out my paint and my color but eventually I think it'll be a pretty good accurate representation of the belly button hedgehog that looks I've never seen those types of mushrooms before that's yeah, super cool and I was really surprised um when now that I'm walking around this time of year I'm actually looking more carefully to see if I can find this one. I haven't seen it yet in the wild, um, so it'll be really exciting when I come across one. I'll know exactly what it is. Definitely. But I'm always amazed that um, nature seems to be the hardest thing to sculpt because it's already so perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it's a real challenge, but it's a lot of fun. And yeah. is it, will it be displayed similar to, is that a, a like draft of what it would look like yeah, in display? Yeah, this was my first attempt um, and this, I started to populate the bottom with the teeth, but this is a different material. This is a foam. It's a little softer and more flexible. And I wasn't able to get the, the teeth to be as pointy as I needed. So I, I moved away from the foam and went to a clay. But the nice thing about the foam is that it, it you can create some beautiful organic shapes. And uh, I, I hit a magnet in here, so it just magnets to its base. Oh. So that, that was kind of nice, but for these ones, I'm gonna actually, um, I'm gonna glue them to the form uh, and then cover the, the earth form with some moss and some needles. So I'm really excited to get this done so I can then paint them. I'm working on a lobster mushroom, which looks freakishly like a lobster coming up out of the ground. And it's actually, it's called the lobster crust because it's actually um, an invasive uh, fungus that takes over another mushroom. And it grows, so there's actually probably a rusula inside or some other, other mushroom and the crust grows around it. So it, to me, it looks shockingly like a pizza that's just come out of the oven on top. It does. Um, you know, it's just strange. But they, I have seen them in the wild, walking through the forest and mushroom picking, and they are the shocking orange red color. They just are. So they're pretty distinctive, pretty hard to mistake it for anything else, I think, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and then the other one I'm working on is my favorite, is the chanterelle. And everybody, I think, if you go mushroom picking, as I've had the pleasure to do with friends who used to be pickers, they, um, they actually um, taught me how to pick and how to find chanterelles and they um, are also pretty distinctive when you see them. Um, they don't have gills like um, other mushrooms, they have more veins and they tend to be like little tree branches and that is what distinguishes it. Now, feedback on these mushrooms is that they're a little bit yellow. So I need to tan them down a little bit. They need to be a little bit more of a buff color. And the green spots on top are actually where I've taken some artist's masking material. And when I peel that little bit off, it's like latex. And when I peel that little bit of green off, you get a little white spot like that over there. So that way I can paint. And in the end, I'll end up with little white spots on the top of my mushroom like that. Oh, perfect. So it's just a little that. technique so that I don't have to go back in and add white on top, which you'd see that. You'd see a little dab of white. This way, most of those little spots are little divots, just like on this. So that's how I'm trying to get that technique. And, you know, we all started out and everybody's trying different mediums uh, or media. And, um, we found this really high density foam was really easy to carve um, and it holds its shape and you can sand it and you can spray paint it, it doesn't melt. And so we really, um, I, most of us have used some aspect of that, but then everybody has a different shape and a different, um, Devon's mushrooms are very creamy on top, very smooth and obviously my, my lobster is not. And um, the chanterelles are, they're not slimy, they're they're more of a rubbery texture. So I've used um, a few different things on top to get this, this sort of 
um, smoothness that's not mm. too wet looking. So I think that's the challenge at this point is the finishing stage for me. It's just first getting the colors right, great getting the look right, getting things to flow right, and we're using a combination of little tiny paint brushes and, and an airbrush. Um, but then it's also knowing when to step back mm. and don't add any more. And you want to go, oh, but oh, I don't want to add it. No. <laughs> step back from the shroom. <laughs> step back from the shroom. <laughs> Lovely. There'll be a moment when it's like, it's done. <laughs> and apparently, I, I missed the feedback from the experts, but they said the the, the lobster's looking great. So I can, pretty, there's a couple things I see that I mm. want to change. <laughs> Will I? I don't know. We'll see. But the, the chanterelle needs to be just knocked down a little bit in its, its brightness. And like you're saying, the diversity of the um, materials and stuff you've been using is similar. Also, the diversity of different mushrooms. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. Like, so it makes sense why you'd have to use different things. Exactly. They have different textures. Here in the exhibit department, each of us was assigned uh, two to three mushroom types to, to construct. And so uh, once we got our list, we kind of went about doing some research which mostly meant just going on the internet and finding pictures of the mushrooms that were assigned to us. So I've got three mushrooms. I've got the prince, morels, and some truffles. So these are the pictures that I found and uh, working with the experts, getting some ideas on how they're supposed to look and which ones they prefer. Once that happens, then we, uh, we just grab some styrofoam. This is high density styrofoam and uh, it's got a really fine um, texture to it so it works really well for for these projects um, we'll then you know do some drawings on there take it to the bandsaw cut it out and then we'll use um, some of the power tools here in our wood shop some belt sanders and such to kind of get a more general shape we also have this tool here which is um, this dremel tool and we have a little vacuum collector here so the dust doesn't bother us. So getting the general shape of everything. And so uh, you can see here's a mushroom here, which is not painted. I would have, you know, done the general shape and then worked on all the details afterwards using that Dremel. So the Dremel really works well to get all these details in something like this. Uh, for, you know, a simple mushroom like this one, probably don't need the Dremel, but you know, some sandpaper or a file was uh, is quite helpful. Once we have the shape, then we use like a variety of uh, materials like plaster or um, even just paint uh, to kind of get the textures. So for example, on, uh, on this stem here, this is actually just drywall plaster and then using a damp sponge, sort of doing like a uh, you know, kind of creating a stipple effect and that kind of gives it this rough texture which you know through our pictures we can we can find um, this here is called a skirt and um, I made that by um, taking uh, paper towel material and squirting it with some a mixture of water and carpenter's glue and that made it wet and then I was able to manipulate it the way I wanted and then within several hours it turned hard with the glue. So you can kind of get that effect which worked out quite well. And then, uh, so once we have the, uh, the general shape, we're happy with it. A variety of painting techniques here, you know, some uh, using an airbrush to kind of get a lot of the, uh, most of the effect. But there might also be, you know, just using brushes to, to work on some of the details um, this here to create this sort of modeled effect as you can see in these pictures I actually dipped it in water and then applied paint in drops and the paint bled around through the water and uh, kind of created this very sort of muddy I guess kind of look and then I would set it aside let it dry and then dip it in water again and apply a different color um, and just kind of work it keep working that way. Now this one was quite tricky to do. I had some trouble with all this texture here, trying to, trying to sculpt that or to apply um, details. So what we end up doing 
was just taking a picture of a mushroom and applying a, uh, a ma uh, an artist medium onto it, which then made it like a sticker or a decoupage. And so we just took it and I just applied it onto the mushroom cap, which was styrofoam. And um, it gave the, uh, the pretty good effect here. I have to adjust this one. The color's a bit off, but it's not too hard to just put another one over top. And then underneath the, the, the mushroom has gills. And this is done by applying a epoxy putty and just waiting for the right time when the epoxy is, is set but not hardened, where I can then take um, uh, a tool that I made, which is just a plexiglass sharpened to a, a fine edge and just dragging it along all the way around until it's done. I had a jig to help with that. So I didn't have to do it freehand, but, mm. uh, and then then and then going back with the airbrushes and painting and all that sort of technique. So a lot of different types of techniques. Yeah, each one's a bit different, um, and as you can see by my work, messy workbench, like these are things I used to make the uh, not everything, not the screwdriver, <laughs> um, but you know even just like a rolled up like a dowel with a piece of sandpaper rolled around it to kind of get the some texture and sanding and shapes to it. And what was the most difficult thing? Would, would it be that mushroom? Yeah, it was one? this one here. Um, I did a couple tests. I tried to paint it. I um, have a failed one over here. You know, I tried to apply little bits of torn paper, uh, but it just, it's just, you know, making something organic is quite tricky, especially when you're trying to make it exactly like that. You know, you can probably make up a mushroom quite easily, but when you're trying to duplicate something that exists in real life, it's difficult. So, oh, sure. but you know, we gotta, we, you know, we work together. Each of us is doing something different. And um, so we throw out some ideas. We talk to each other. What do you think about this? And then I see what one of the art, other artists did with her mushroom. And so I said, well, I'm gonna try that with my mushroom. And, and uh, so they're, you know, we kind of play with each other's ideas and take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and see how it goes. So. There we are. Colin will get you to turn your camera back on as well. Wow, Jenny and Colin and everyone. Devin and Joel and Cindy, thank you so much for sharing that. I was trying to make a list of all the different things you used, Colin, as you talked, and, and I, I'm sure I missed some things. High density styrofoam, clay, drywall plaster, paper towel, paper. What a, there was a, such a big variety of things. Was there anything that uh, was really surprising? Uh, no, I think they kind of got it all. I think, um, I think the one that was key was the, the foam. That really helped us out a lot because we we were maybe we would have maybe had to try you know that blue insulation that people see but that's not really easy to carve it's it's not really very good so that the the insulation was or the uh, the high density polyurethane foam uh, was the was the winner so. Great. Oh, there was a question about that. So yeah. we've got that covered. Um, there's another question here asking, how do you take care of your body during the creating process? I know sculpting detailed things is not the most ergonomic activity. Do you take regular stretch breaks or get massages, massages or <laughs> such things? No massages, but yeah, breaks. We, you know, we're, we are, uh, we have our coffee breaks and our lunch breaks and and um, the, the, the place where we work down here and down the basement is actually kind of large and not everything is in one spot. So we do walk. So, you know, you're, I might be at my workbench, which you saw there, but I might need to walk down to the studio where the others are to grab a particular color of paint. Um, so we do, you know, we get plenty of exercise. Actually, we, um, I've worn um, pedometers in the past and I have put on as many as nine kilometers a day. Working. Wow. Uh, yeah. Especially when we're busy doing gallery stuff. Uh, like, so it's a lot of up, up the elevator, through the gallery, back down again. So, yeah, we, uh, we don't uh, sit around too much. We're not hunched over for very long. And plus, we do, um, you may have seen where Cindy was working. She was in our paint booth. So, for airbrushing, for painting, for noxious fumes, we do have a place where those fumes can be extracted 
um, so we're not having to breathe them. So important. Well, right now the exhibit is at the Swan Lake Christmas Hill Nature Sanctuary here in Greater Victoria. And people can visit that exhibit Mondays through Friday from nine to three, um, and this Saturday from 12 to four. And that's at 3873 Swan Lake Road. Mm -hmm. And Leslie is wondering, um, and maybe you know, Colin, is the exhibit going to be moving around the province? I believe so. I'm not quite privy to where um, they're going to be going to. We have um, someone who deals with uh, organizing that, uh, arranging for transportation and, and spaces to, to do it. But I, um, I'm pretty sure that stuff will be obviously uh, transmitted to everybody so that they know. Uh, but at this moment, it's, uh, it's at Swan Lake for the time being. So. Right. Uh, and a guest who has seen the exhibit, or maybe is at Swan Lake, Caitlin, is asking, do you know how the underside of the King Belletti got made? It's a spongy texture, and it seems difficult to create. Yeah, that's that. That was Megan who did that paper, uh, the same way I made the top of my mushroom, which was the prince, using that image. She did the same thing on the bottom with an underside image of, the, uh, of that um, mushroom. So um, yeah, she was the one who taught me that technique, and I, and so exact same, same exact same technique as the top of the prints. So. Very cool, and that must have been a real benefit having you all working on the project and doing slightly different things. Is that you would share something you learned or discovered with the rest of the team, and that made it easier or possible for them to do Absolutely, what they were doing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of us have different skills and experiences, so you know, I wouldn't have even thought of that that image transfer thing. I didn't even know that would, could be done. And, um, but Megan did, and so <laughs> it worked out quite great. Very cool. And well, speaking of the uh, talented team who are down there, there's a question asking, how do you find um, your sculptors and people who work on your team? And how would an interested person apply to be involved in such projects? Well, a lot of us have some art degree background or experience um, or museum experience. So it's kind of, it's kind of a tricky job to kind of get um, the, there's only a limited number of positions here at the museum, but I imagine in the future, you know, there will be more as we retire or as projects come up. Um, we generally look for people with a broad sense of skills. So, you know, you don't have to be a carpenter, but if you're a really good painter and landscape painter, uh, sculptor, those are all things that we look for. And um, occasionally as these positions come up on the museum's website, um, that's where you'll find uh, when we're looking for people. We don't generally, you know, just bring people in whenever. Um, but uh, the more skills you have, the better chance you have of getting this job. So for example, like uh, I bring in a lot of my skills are kind of construction type based. So it's welding, uh, carpentry, uh, model making, that kind of thing. But, you know, we also have people who are one woman, uh, she was a jewelry maker for a long time, but she's also a, a really good painter. Another guy is, um, he's done a lot of work uh, doing uh, like, um, like paintings as an artist. So it's uh, Devin that you met, he brings skills with um, CNC computer uh, machinery and, and fabrication. So it's just a wide variety of skills and the more things you can do and teach yourself, the better chance you'll have. Thank you so much, Colin. Yes, do keep an eye on our website for any opportunities that might be coming up. Uh, it's such a fascinating project. Uh, the mushrooms turned out amazing. Everyone should be congratulated. You did such a terrific job. And again, if, uh, if folks are interested in learning more about mushrooms, please check out our publications on the website for a copy of your Mushrooms of BC handbook. Uh, they've been really popular. Uh, so do check that out if you're interested. Our next RBCM at Home is scheduled for December the 14th. And my guests will be curators from the Alaska State Museum. And they're going to be sharing how they did a recent new gallery um, exhibit using community curation. So a really interesting model to talk about. Until then, everyone, please take care of yourselves and one another. And thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.